Hey, everybody. Welcome to the MA Heat Podcast. Karen Bryan here with you back in Los Angeles. How's it going, Alan? Good to have you back. What's up, guys? Alan Jovan here as well. So listen, we will talk about uh, Fight Island 3 today and, um, you know, some of the highlights of the fights. And um, I can just kind of let you know about my experience over there and stuff. But Alan, how are you feeling? How's things? Yeah, well, uh, just right before we started this podcast a couple minutes ago, I actually got uh, results back from a COVID test that I did and unfortunately I tested positive. So um, gonna have to put my UFC comeback uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, have to wait it out a couple of weeks. So um, it, it bummed me out, but at the same time, I'm just, you know, taking it in stride. Uh, I know I'm a healthy person, so I don't think I'm at like a health risk so much in terms of bad things happening, but it's more about just being responsible calling everybody that I know uh, that I was around yeah. um, and kind of quarantining in my home with my family. So with that said, I let the UFC know. I said I, I was shooting for late September with the UFC, but we called them early and said, look, if we could uh, hopefully just do like sometime in October, maybe that'll work now until I get through this. So, so that's my stage right now. I just found out literally like an hour or so ago. I think I got the email. Uh, so um, how you I feeling feel though? Overall. I feel pretty good. I mean, like, if I'm going to break it all down, Sunday is when I said I'm feeling pretty crappy, symptoms, fever, uh, body aches. Mm -hmm. And then yesterday was on again, off again, the same type of stuff, kind of dry, dry throat, fever. Um, and then I've been just kind of loading up on vitamins and um, kind of quarantining, and I feel much better today. I couldn't have done this. I could have done this show yesterday, but I would have been, I would have been crappy. <laughs> I wouldn't have been very good. Um, and so I feel much better today. So, um, yeah, I think I'm just going to stay in and hopefully 10 to 14 days um, I could test again and be negative and then get back to training. But we'll just have to see. We'll have to see what kind of uh, residual effects it has on my, on my system after I get healthy again. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, I'm really lot. sorry to I hear know. it. Um, I know. It sucks. It's crazy, too, because – I feel like I've been such a safe person. The granted, the thing is, we're fighters. And so right. I don't want to compare myself to a frontline worker. But what I'm saying is my job puts me at risk, just right. like uh, a police officers, firefighters, frontline workers, people that have to have to mix it up with people all the time. If, if you can stay at home all day and do your job, then you're less at risk. But I know that I have to take a chance. I, if yeah. I'm going to train and I'm a fighter and I'm hopefully fighting in, in two months, I have to go and train so but what I have done is been very responsible at training with small groups of people yeah. if I try to train with uh at the at the, at the gyms or, or with that are smaller training outdoors more frequently yeah. um using the same partners over and over that type of thing and so it's just you can't really control it what's going on right now and um I'm bummed that I got it I know that I did pretty much everything in my powers not to get it but to still be able to train right. I was just unlucky but um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy when I see guys that have fought two or three times during this quarantine, and I'm like, how did they go through these eight week camps or whatever week camps and not get it? And I was unfortunate enough to get it. So that part kind of kind of bumped me out. But I know, you know, it is what it is. I'll deal with it and get through it. Yeah. Well, hopefully you you do get better, and hopefully you never gets that bad, and hopefully the rest of the family stays safe too. Um, yeah. And like you said, you let the other people know that you were training with. So hopefully everybody else is okay too. You know, nobody gets it bad. That's, that's the crappiest part of it, honestly, is like having yeah. to think, where was I the last five days? And right. then call everybody and, and put that concern and burden on them. And, yeah. and it, it, it felt like I had to cancel a fight or it felt, it felt like I was kind of embarrassed, to be honest, like yeah. to call people and say, look, I'm sorry. And so that, that's the more crappy feeling than it is of like, oh crap, am I, am I at risk or not? It's like once I got over, okay, I'm a pretty healthy guy. I'm going to yeah. be okay. But now I have to think about the side effects of people that I've been around the last couple right. of days and this and that and make sure that they're okay. So, so I'm still kind of doing that right now, uh, texting and calling and getting that all organized. And once that's done, figuring out the quarantine situation. My son tested negative, Cage, uh, but my wife's results didn't come back yet. So we're okay. still all kind of quarantining. I'm sleeping in separate rooms. Yeah. Um, until we get it all figured out. 
Well, all righty. Um, well, I hope you're yeah. you're going to be okay, and I know everybody sends all the all the positive thoughts your way. You know, um, I obviously just got back from Abu Dhabi, where I got tested five times over the course yeah. of the since the 11th um, to the 26th. So the last time I got tested was on Friday. We had to get tested before every event to be order in order to to work the other one. So I will mm -hmm. say this: you know, it, it was kind of nice, um, even though the whole time over there, if you were walking through the hotel, you're supposed to have your mask on every every time we got into the bus. You know, to go over to the forum or any any you know to go down to the beach you had to have your masks on so anytime you're around other people you're supposed to have your masks on um but then you know it did get to the point where obviously when you're in the restaurants we could let that down. I mean, it was nice to know everybody was safe. They'd even quarantined yeah. all the staff there and everything like that too. I saw somebody was uh, giving me grief because um, I did the car racing thing and somebody was trying to give me uh, grief about that. Uh, by the way, the video's on YouTube and um, and on our Facebook page. Um, <laughs> by the way. So somebody was like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, they, they ruined it for that driver, you know, and what a risk. And then I was like, dude, time out. Like everybody what? was quarantined. Everybody that worked there was quarantined yeah. for weeks. This and that, like the the the, the undertaking that actually uh, just happened over there is, is nothing short of a miracle. Like it really is incredible um, what the UFC pulled off, what the tourism board in Abu Dhabi pulled yeah. off, like all, all, Emirates Airlines, like all that stuff. Um, it, it really was incredible. Um, but so, yeah, I guess my point is that like I felt good and it was nice because in our little bubble over there, you knew everybody was safe because everybody yeah. tested so much. Then, of course, coming home even though we were all in our charter, but like once we get back, I had to go through Vegas and then you're know, then I'm looking at everybody again. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm eyeballing that guy and then that one doesn't have his mask on and da 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 da. And you know, back to being paranoid. I got home. I literally, all I did was run out to the store, get some food and I'm home for like a couple weeks now. So I'm work, I'm working next weekend in Vegas. So I just need to stay right. there and yeah, and all that. So I was supposed to maybe work this weekend. Some stuff got switched around. Um, so next weekend and everything. So um, yeah, it was an incredible trip. Um, I don't know what was stood out for you, Alan, you know, there was 15 fights and everything. Um, it was incredible to me. Like it, it was really one of those highlight memory, uh, fights yeah. to, to work, um, to see that the trilogy fight of, of Shogun and Noguera, you know what I mean? To see Verdun's last it's, fight in the UFC and to see him go out on a win. I don't yeah. know if people know that, that that's his last one. Um, to see Whitaker until in person and, and Whitaker on the comeback for me, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, I, I, there was a lot and freaking Hamza Shemaev. Shemaev. Is the, like unbelievable. So I don't, I'm not sure what really stood out to you. You said a lot of it. You pretty much, you, you bullet pointed all of them. I would do want to get into the Shemaev thing uh, after we go ahead and maybe break down the main event or whatever. And then I uh, can get into some of the highlights of not only, I think, that card but then just fight island in general because really the entire fight island array of cards the four right. or five that they had i there was a certain number of international fighters that really stood out to me um mm -hmm. i mean i feel like the ufc did so good at not only being one of the first sports back making this whole thing happen as you explained at fight island with every all the chaos going on making this go down without a hitch but at the end of it, they come out with a, a number of massive stars at the end yeah. that they did not have before this whole thing started. So uh, I will try to remind myself to get into that when we get done. But let's talk about uh, the main event going into this one. Yeah, okay. Well, so going into this one, you know, um, I was working as the reporter. So, you know, you go to all the fighter meetings. And how can I just say it? Like Robert Whitaker came in and he was a breath of fresh air. Like mm -hmm. this was a, a new Robert Whitaker. You know, the whole thing is that he was talking about how he gotten burnt out. And that's why he, uh, you know, stepped away from the game for a little while. And after the Adesanya loss and everything, and he, you know, he was fried. Like long story short, he was just like, I didn't have any will to train anymore. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do it. He said, you know, I had been on this grind for so many years. And they kept that whole philosophy of if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So a lot of things that he maybe wanted to tweak or wasn't going right or whatever, they didn't change, right? Because he still was winning. You're beating Yoel Romero twice. You're doing this, you know? So he didn't change a lot of things. And um, after that uh, Adesanya loss, it gave him a chance to just reset and all this stuff. So he took months off, didn't want to, didn't want to do anything. And literally, when he, he said now, like, we're like, well, what's so different? He's like, well, the different thing is now I don't train on Sundays. I'm like, oh, holy yeah. crap, like you were training seven days a week, like all this time. Um, but he was in such a good mood. He had, he was cracking jokes. He's laughing. Like it, he found his love again. And so like, as soon as he walked out of that meeting, I'm like, holy crap, like a reinvigorated Whitaker is freaking scary. Yeah. 
I, I, I relate to that so much. I, first of all, I don't train on Sunday ever. <laughs> um, if I do, it's like paddle boarding. It's, it's right. active recovery, but you gotta have, you gotta have one day to recover. That way Monday you can come and hit it strong. But I envision my, I say comeback because I've been gone for a year and a half or so with injuries. Uh, it's the same way coming back in and being a breath of fresh air yeah. and enjoying the process and not beating yourself up over everything having to be perfect or being so intense mm -hmm. or the stare downs in the hallway and all those things, but enjoying the process of something you have to go through anyway, makes it a lot more enjoyable. So I'm glad to hear that he was like that all week. And I think it showed, I think it showed on both of their performances, to yeah. be honest. Both guys seem to really be on point during fight week on point inside of the octagon and so on. Yeah, that's not to take away from Darren at all, because Darren, we know, is just more of a good natured guy, right? Anyway, yeah. like a more of a, a jokester and stuff. And so same thing, like he came in, he was cracking jokes, he seemed comfortable, like, and I believe, you know, literally, and it's the whole thing where you guys are like, oh, I had the best camp of my life. He's like, no, I really mean it. You know what I mean? And this is the second fight he got to do at 185. Um, you know, he's really, he, he, he's, what I really like about him is his candor, his willingness to be vulnerable. And he, he'll say like, look, when, I, when I'm vulnerable, I actually draw strength from that. So he spoke to me after losing and he's like, look, if people think all I have is a left hand, he's like, and look how far I got already. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, that's incredible. I'm only 29 or something, right? So he has a really wow. good head on his shoulders about it. But he did say in the fight, you know, one of Robert's um, knee stomps really just trashed his knee. And, uh, yeah. and he was, you know, unable to really do a lot of work after that. Like, I thought it was a competitive fight. But to me, it seemed that Robert was was definitely winning the fight. For, You know, even though even though it, it was competitive, I wasn't, I wasn't doubting at all that it was going to go to Robert. Well, uh, so I'll, 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 get, I'll dig into that a little bit deeper. I agree. I, I, too, had Robert Whitaker for the win, but I did think it was going to be an up-in-the-air one, and that could go either way. Okay. I thought that Robert Whitaker landed the most amount of strikes, and I felt like he controlled the octagon mm -hmm. a bit more at times. But Till, Till, man, this guy, he is so good at – um, he faints. He faints his lead yes. hand so religiously – that he keeps yeah. Robert. That's why they said it was such a stressful fight. It was all those fainting right. would keep them both doing it. And that's why they kept saying, oh, it was, it was stressful. It was a chess match. It's any little thing could happen at any moment. You saw the head kicks that they kept dodging out of the way. Totally, yeah. And every time they would commit, both guys were trying to end the fight. There wasn't a lot of, like, tiny setups. There were tiny right. feints. But when they would commit and cross that, like, invisible red danger zone, they were going for the kill every time. And it made it a stressful fight. But what I was getting to is, Robert landed a lot more shots, I thought. Mm -hmm. Till landed a lot more damage. But okay. I had somebody on Twitter kind of ask me, like, you know, what is a, what do you classify? I think I did damage in quotation marks, and they were asking. Right. Damage is how things are scored. So blood would be damage. But again, we've debated this a thousand times. If, I, if you hit me one time and I bleed, but I hit you three times, and maybe even being harder, then who's really doing the most damage? It's very right. confusing. Yeah. But Till was able to show a lot more physical blood type of damage with the knockdown, mm -hmm. the blood uh, on Whitaker. But Whitaker was able to take that damage and not show any residual signs, meaning he took it and then he got right back in there and punched him again. It's not like he was wobbly or in fear of losing the fight. So I had to kind of discredit some of Till's offense, not discredit it, but I couldn't say that the 10 shots that Robert landed and then Till's one shot that made Whitaker bleed were equal because they weren't. It was just blood, but uh, but um, Robert, sorry, was still winning the fight in my mind. And then especially when the last round with the takedowns, though he didn't do much with it, right. he was able to take him down and control the fight. Two or three takedowns inside of the last minute. I thought it was 2-2. Two -two. I think mm -hmm. that's probably how most people saw it going into the fifth round. You, you, it sounds to me that, care, that you had it 3-1. Actually, to be honest with you, I was interviewing Shogun yeah. during the second round, so I don't, I, yeah. Didn't have it round by yeah. round, got you. I had a two for two going into the fifth round, going into the last minute. I had Robert, Robert Whitaker winning. Till knocks him down, gets a cut, but then Whitaker jumps right back up, right. finishes strong on the cage. I, 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 you had to give it to Robert Whitaker, in my opinion. So it wasn't a, a hugely debatable fight, but it was one that could have been seen from different eyes, depending on how the damage was scored. But I thought it was the right decision and just a great fight. You saw at the end of the fight, no man felt like they lost and no fan watching it felt like, oh, this guy, it wasn't like somebody's stock had dropped. 
It wasn't like, oh, he didn't do the right Not things. At all, yeah. He didn't make the right changes. Both men put on a beautiful performance, and there had to be a winner. Yeah, I like I said, I was doing an interview uh, for the second round, but then I, I was able to watch, I think, the last two rounds uh, out yeah. right by the Octagon, which was great. And I remember being very, very impressed by the pace. And like yeah. you were saying, like the fact that they were still like matrixing out of head kicks and stuff like that in the fifth round, like I was really, really impressed with their conditioning and everything. And the fact that they had such a pace going and yeah, the whole time, like they were at each other. Like you said, that red zone, like it wasn't like they were doing a lot of waiting around, like they went for yeah. it. Um, so I, I totally appreciate that. And a hundred percent agree that, um, both their stocks went up and that's kind of like what, what, what we're saying about Darren before he's like, if I got this far with quote unquote, only a left hand, you know what I mean? Then like you guys are basically all screwed because what happens when he gets the rest of the game, which he obviously has. And, um, the thing about the feints, like you saw, I don't know if you saw afterwards, Robert was even joking about that in there. He's like, Oh my God, I kept biting on your feints all the time. And, um, they had such a good, uh, report with each other. And I just, um, it was like a really good fight to end on, right? Because like you said, mm -hmm. nobody felt like they lost. I feel like it was a great fight for both guys, but I am I feel like just really happy to have Robert Whitaker back. Like I love yeah. him as a champ. I think he's awesome. Um, I love it, Israel Adesanya as well. And so I just really want that rematch. Like I want to see what happens again. And I don't like one of them more than the other, but I think they are both awesome. You know what I mean? So I just am happy to have like the old Robert Whitaker back, or even if it's not the old one, like new Robert Whitaker. Whitaker, Sundays off Whitaker is awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and so I, I same I feel the same about Whitaker, uh, same about Adesanya. Big fans of both. But if we're thinking there's going to be a rematch, I got to see what happens with Adesanya and uh, right. Blanchini and first Costa, because yeah. I feel like he is the dark horse. I mean, he is just a destroyer, and I don't know. I I, I this is getting off topic, but I, man, I I don't know if Adesanya is going to take that fight. We'll get into that at another time, but. That's going to be – I'm more excited about that title fight than the DC, DC Stipe, than the Khabib, yeah. uh, um, Justin Gaethje that's just announced, all those other ones. I'm more excited about this middleweight clash. I'm, I'm excited about that too, but my – we'll see what happens in that one. I, we might be on opposite sides of that one. We might be on opposite Karen, sides. <laughs> agree to disagree. Hey, so listen um, – Think you share a birthday with Shogun Hua, right? Don't you? You guys have a sim or your birthdays are close together. He's a legend. Same day, born on the same day. That's right. That's right. Well, he won the trilogy with with Little Nog, and Little Nog retired afterwards. You know, um, they were both really in great moods before this whole fight too, and they were talking to us about like you know back in the day when we first fought each other, it was a real rivalry between Shoot to Box and Brazilian Top Team. But yeah. you know, over the years. Um, you know, they're all become legends and like the rivalry part wasn't there as much, but still the spirit of competition was there for sure. And really basically the whole point on that, why they did the trilogy is Noguera really thought he won the fight at UFC 190. Um, mm -hmm. That was the second fight. So they got fight of the night for it and everything. But Lil Nog really thought he won that one. It was a decision. So Shogun won all of them by decision, but they were good close fights and they, there's something about them. They really just seem to bring out like a really good fight in each other. Yeah, they're good stylistically, they're, they're fun to watch. And, and Nogueira was kind of like the boxer right. before the fight. Nogueira's the boxer, Shogun, yeah. more of the kicker. At this stage in your career, like, well, me and, me and Shogun are the same age. So I don't right. want to say he's the older guy, but yeah, we're the older guys <laughs> in the He's sport. got more years on him, though. Fight more fight <laughs> years. Yeah. yeah, but Shogun stopped being the kicker a while back. You know, when, when Shogun fought John Jones, they were like, John Jones, how are you going to deal with the kicks? And, like, there was not a kick thrown. Right. John Jones was able to have his way with him. But Shogun has always had really good boxing. He just had devastating kicks, which with his age and his years, he's kind of pulled back from the hips. Well, he's get had, tighter. he had a lot of knee problems. Exactly. The hips get tighter, the knee problems start yeah. to occur. And it just, it takes more energy. It really takes more energy to expend a, 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 it all on, on a kick when you can just throw a punch. So, He's become more of a kind of a pocket fighter, a boxer that'll take a punch and give a punch. And that's what set up another beautiful trilogy fight amongst them. Both guys had their moments in the fight, but I, I think it was the right decision quite again going with Shogun. But I couldn't tell. Um, and you said you were able to watch this fight live when it was happening? Yeah, I was doing interviews back there too. So I saw, I think the, I saw mostly the first and third. 
gotcha. So most of the fights you were working and watching and doing everything. I got like you, watching and working and, and then we were actually I was interviewing Paul and we had to watch the end of the Shogun fight because we only had like a limited amount of tape things. So we're like sitting there waiting to do our interview all watching that. And you know, he went to a draw with Shogun. So he's like watching it going, this, yeah. do I get my rematch? So it, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if you could hear the commentary, but the commentary, Dan Hardy, who is like a, a fight nerd in a good way. Like he just, Great. you know, he, he geeks out on that kind of stuff. He would not stop talking about pride and this and that. And so I couldn't tell if it was on the commentary or literally just from watching it, but it felt, it felt like I was 15 years ago watching pride or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's nice. just, when I'm watching it, it's like Shogun versus Noguera and the style, I felt like they were fighting in like a pride style yet. There wasn't head stomps, but it almost seemed just like these are, this is what we're doing. We're punching each other and kicking each other. Like there's not, a new style of MMA here. It was kind of right. like an old style of MMA of fighting in a weird way. I don't know if I was just seeing things, having flashbacks, or that's just really occurring, but it was fun. It was like nostalgic. It was like, this is a throwback fight. This is a throw, these are throwback fighters yeah. in a throwback fight in a trilogy. So just as you said, it was, it was an honor to watch. Like hearing Dan geek out about it, he's like, I'm so excited that I'm, I know. you told me this 15 years ago. I was like, I was like, all right, I'm a little bit jealous, Dan. Shut up. Like, I'm yeah. kind of one of, I wish I was there commentating it too, because it sounded like that much fun. Yeah, it really was. I mean, that was the whole thing, right? The whole time, the buildup of them all week. Like, we were joking, like, if there was a, a Mount Rushmore of Brazilian fighters, like, yeah. since the Nogueras are twins, you could basically put, you know, half of each Noguera face, then Shogun, Anderson, and Jose Aldo. Like, for yeah. me, that's the, that's the Brazilian Mount Rushmore, right? And so yeah. you're seeing two, two elements of them there. A hall of famer you know all this stuff and so um just because there was so much history there it was just really it was really fun like it, it and and shogun was thrilled after like he was so happy that he, he, was, won. Really happy. he was so happy and uh you know because he's only got a couple three more fights left in him too like he's got two or three more fights so he, he everything really matters to him too um the fights that he takes are very important to him you know mm -hmm. and and the legacy all of this so it's it's I know he was very happy to win that fight. And, you know, Noguera told us before he was going to retire. And then, then he said, then I guess there were, he was walking around going, well, maybe it's my last one. But then afterwards he did retire. I think for me, the only sad part of that is that um, to, to end without a crowd, like obviously we all paid tribute to him and yeah. we all, you know, honored him as much as we could, but it sucks to like not have that crowd send off and everything. Cause you, you know, you deserve it. Um, th that was the only thing that I felt like a little bad about, but otherwise, mm -hmm. like if I, on my stories for Instagram, I actually was backstage, you know, there and filmed some stuff and I, I put them on my highlights. So I have a fight Island and a fight Island too. And near the end of the, those, you'll see, I was back there when Shogun and Nogueira were talking to each other and like hugging each other and just having this great moment. And you know, in the part of me, I was like, I kind of feel bad for filming this is like a private moment. And then the other part is like, this is legendary. You know what I mean? There's no way I'm not filming this. So uh, yeah. yeah, just good guys. And um, a nice send off, I think in a way, at least it was a hell of a fight. You know what I mean? For Nogueira okay. to go out, you know, battling all 15 minutes on the way out, I think is great. Um, I did mention at the top that it was Verdum's last fight in the UFC. I don't know if a lot of people knew that going in, but it was. Um, obviously, this was Gus's first fight as a heavyweight. And, you know, he's fought a specialist, Alan. Like, I, I was talking to Gus after, and he's yeah. like, he took it really well. You know, he said he's just a bad loser. That's why he, quote, unquote, retired before, because he didn't like that Anthony Smith loss. And he was just, like, salty. But he misses competing. He's a competitor, you know. So he took this well in terms of like, yeah, it sucks to lose another fight. But, you know, it was only his first fight up at heavyweight. I think he looks good as a heavyweight. But also he fought a total specialist in Verdun. Yeah. And, you know, you said he, he fought a specialist. He was a second or two late a couple of times yeah. on, um, look, would he have gotten out of the on bar? We don't know. Right. Maybe unlikely. Was there some opportunities to create a scramble? Yes, yes. He could have corkscrewed at one point. And if I'm getting overly technical, which I don't want to do, but, you know, he was kind of defending with an S grip. And normally yeah. that's like the weakest grip. You want to go with something else or even like a rear naked choke mm -hmm. to kind of protect the arm. So I didn't love all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you're fighting for Doom, a natural heavyweight who's one of the best submission experts we've ever had inside of the octagon. And he had a control of your arm. It was probably inevitable, and there's no reason to hang your, head, your chin, your head down right. at the end of a loss like that. But, yes, was it too quick? Did we get to see them mix it up? No, not nearly enough. I wanted to see so much more to that fight. 
I wanted to see Gu I was so excited to see Gustafson fight again. I felt like we don't see Gustafson anymore. And he was such like, he came onto the scene as such a star in the UFC. And then him and John's made him like a superstar between him and John Jones's fight. And then yeah. he was gone for a while and now he's back and it was so short lived. So I'm hoping, like you said, that he, he takes it well in defeat and comes back since he's not injured. You know, he had that fight, he got on bar, but he shouldn't be injured come back and maybe get on another card soon. Yeah, I think he's all right with it. You know, he posted something like, hey, look, I'm alive. Life is good. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. here to fight another day. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure he would have liked to, to win that fight. But yeah. he was in a good vibe. And, and I, he, I think he looks good as a heavyweight. Like, I think that's you, – you seem full Viking at that point. You know what I mean? It just seems, like, more appropriate even. And I don't think he uh, – he was saying, like – I don't think he was saying he would, he, you know, he's totally ridden off 205 or anything like that, but he wants mm -hmm. to do heavyweight. And I think there's a lot, I mean, obviously there's a huge future there um, because yeah. literally after DC and Stipe fight, like they might both retire. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that, um, that Gus will have great fights against. Like I, I, I'm glad, you know, it sucks to lose it, but, but I think he is taking it the right way and, uh, and is only just gonna, He'll be fine. Is it? He got his feet wet. He's uninjured. There's more to come. Yeah. Right. Well, and as we know, heavyweights are the are the oldest group, right? In terms of, uh, yeah. and I, I got all my paperwork here. I don't even remember how old Gus is. He's not even that old anyway. Um, and so uh, he'll be fine. But like, um, yeah, he's only 33. Please, he's got. Okay, I was gonna guess 35 or something. Yeah. Tons of time. Tons of time. Um, Verdum is though probably going to go to either like Bellator or one FC. Mm -hmm. Um, he's not going to stop fighting yet. He's 42, but he's not going to stop fighting. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was, that was the last time that we will see him in the UFC. So that is a bit of a bummer. Um, you know, obviously he's a former champion and stuff, and he's just been a really good friend to me and Wade, um, for years. He's one of the guys that we first started, um, you know, coverage with and all the, that's why we're so bonded to the guys at Kings. Verdum is a really big part of that. And like every time at the beginning when I was first learning Portuguese, obviously I'm still learning. Um, but, mm -hmm. and his like English, his English would meet my Portuguese in the middle. Um, but they just were always so patient and just really, really, just really good people to us. And, you know, we were there when he beat Fedor and Wade shot all this incredible footage of the celebrations backstage and stuff like that, that they love and value and treasure so much too. And it was, it was just like a really special night up in San Jose. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just happy for Verdum that he got to leave on a high like that. It just sucked that I had to go against somebody that I like so much too. Like, that's one of those where you're like, can we get a draw? <laughs> yeah. Do you know the reasoning behind him not re-signing with the UFC? Is that yeah, I don't think he was really too pleased with how they handled his suspension and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. And I, uh, I didn't actually really get into it too much with him. But that's my understanding is that I think he believes he could have been treated better um, through some He's of the He's had a rocky road. Some, yeah, He's some people. He's had a rocky are, road to see, you know, on and off again, right. suspensions and whatnot. So, yeah, right. I see. Right. So, until then, who knows, like, if he'll still work on the commentary, right? Because he still does, he was doing deportes and things like that. So I don't know what yeah. will happen with that. But, you know, he's managed by Ali and they're already, you know, looking for other options for him. So it was good for him to go out. His value will be higher there with that win. Yeah. Um, and incidentally, crazily enough, Hoffa is training Tyson for that fight, you know? So we were literally, we were all in the same flight home, obviously from Abu Dhabi, but then also from Vegas to home. Yeah. And literally, we, we, we landed in L.A. at like 11.45 yesterday morning, and Hafa was going to train Tyson at like 2 o'clock. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not even a trainer, but I'm like jealous. I'm like, <laughs> I want to train Tyson. I don't even I know. know. It's like, it's like when, when the whole Tyson fighting against us started coming out, I wasn't a fan because it was talking about Tyson versus Evander. And right. I was like, you know what? I love both of these men, and Evander – He's slowing down, like, the way he speaks and stuff. And I don't want right. to see anybody get any head, tra head trauma or brain. Like, I don't want to see it. Tyson versus uh, Roy Jones Jr. is a bit different. It's a right. bit of a younger matchup. Um, uh, Roy Jones Jr. fought a year or two ago. I mean, yeah. he, he's still kind of active now and then for these uh, surprise fights. Right. But it's like, I feel like I'm reliving my childhood. Like, <laughs> my two favorite fighters are fighting each other from my childhood. It's, it's a very odd thing like i i don't even know how i feel about it but i'm definitely watching yeah oh i'm definitely watching too but i'm just like i'm just psyched that my friend is training tyson you know what i mean I'm like yeah you kidding me right now like are you kidding me? he's like he, and even hoff is like 
I'm training my hero. He's like, like, he's like, what? Like, what? Insane. It's also kind of shocking that, that uh, Cor- Rafael Cordero is training Tyson. Like Tyson is from such the old school I know. of boxing. And then, no, let me go with a uh, Brazilian MMA coach <laughs> for my boxing comeback. Like it kind of doesn't make sense. Not like Rafael doesn't know what to do, but you know what I mean? Yes. Boxing guys are very opinionated yeah. on styles and coaches and all oh, this yeah. stuff. And, and old school type training versus MMA training, like everything's very different. And so yeah. for him to make that decision is kind of, um, Tyson's a new guy. He's yeah. enlightened. You know, he's at, the, he's at the ranch over there opening up his mind. Opening up horizons. Yeah. It's great. I, I think it's great. And like, and to your point, yeah, yeah. it speaks really well for Hoffa and, and the evolution of MMA coach striking and all that. Um, okay. So a couple more things on the, on the main card there. Uh, Carla Sparza picked up her fourth win in a row against Tough Florida fight. Good job, that Carla was a, that was a close that. fight, but I, I'm, I'm psyched for Carla. Did you, she, uh, that was you a very that? tough fight. Her eye was closed. She was going against a dangerous opponent. Even when Carla would get her down, she was taking some damage. Yeah. Carla, it was one of those fights that I could see it. Carla was exhausted. And yeah. she just said, I have to get this girl down. I have to stay active for five minutes to win this round. She did what she had to do. Not the most entertaining fight. One of those fights that I could see it in the fighter. This, that they were like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. I got to do what I got to do. She got it done. I, I, I just, that was a, a dig deep performance. It wasn't like, oh, they were bloody and going back and forth. But it was a very much dig deep because she was exhausted and having to work so hard to just stay out of triangles and arm bars and elbows when she was on top and staying active and keeping yeah. her down. So uh, I, I, I was texting Carla this morning, like her eye was shut and she, yeah. this and that. And I was like, you still look pretty. Like I was just trying to compliment her as much as possible because I was, um, I was very impressed with her performance because I know, I know she was tired in those later rounds. Well, yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Like they, they had to just like suck it up and grind, like keep going. I mean, and that was the yeah. thing, right? Cause before the fight, Marina was saying that, um, you know, the last time she was fighting, she had a draw with Cynthia Calvillo, and she was like, "I got to, I'm gonna totally fight like differently, and I promise, and everything." And she said to like to me, she's like, "If if Carla comes with the same, you know, fire and passion that I that I am bringing to this one, like I think we're gonna have an incredible fight and everything." And so they, she was, she really wanted to give a show, like she really wanted to to, to prove, like that there was a lot more to her. You know what I mean? Um, but when we know Carla is so tough and. She's like, look at every, some people write me off and said I'm out of the title picture, but like mm-hmm. she is the inaugural champion. That's four wins in a row right now. I mean, the last time we saw her, she beat Michelle Watterson. That was just in May. And she is a person that I think people still underestimate. I mean, look at Tatiana Suarez is like ridiculous, right? Like, so losing a fight to her is one, it, I, it's fine. Yeah. But like I, he, Carla was saying that she, after that loss, like she, she really, um, realized she had to make a lot of changes, right? Because she was too small. She was getting out muscled. Um, you know what I mean? So she worked a lot on strength and conditioning. Then she said she really started to do a lot more work on her submission game, uh, a lot more work in bottom position from jujitsu. She's still evolving and she's still learning. And, mm-hmm. and I think it's uh, unfair that people have written her off and like taken her out of that title conversation because clearly, She's doing a lot of things right if she's still learning, and that's four in a row in the strawweight division, which is, and she hasn't had easy matchups. So, and look, I'll tell you right now, what separates Carla, Carla from a lot of the girls in the division. Not seeing the other girls doing this, but she does it more than most of them. She stays busy. Carla stays busy. She is always fighting. She comes to the gym. She, I mean, she goes to the fight. She gets banged up. Her eyes shut. She goes to this cryo. She gives herself a week. She's back yeah. in the gym. A month later, she's got to fight news, and then she's fighting again a month after that. She stays busy, and and so, like you said, she dialed off four wins in a row. Yeah. She's getting things going again. She has a loss. She comes back, she fights again. She, she's that active fighter that is always climbing the charts and doing stuff, and so, yeah, yeah I applaud her. I, I really do. I'm happy for her. Okay, well, so right before then, and I mentioned this a, a minute ago when we were talking about Shogun, so Paul Clay got his... Uh, third triangle win, which is the most triangles in all of UFC, um, all the weight classes. So he has the record for that now. And he's tied, I think he's tied with like John Jones and uh, like, um, uh, what's his face? Who's Demir, maybe? I forget. Or, or, oh no, OSP for like third or fourth most, you know, submissions in the division or whatever. But so on that fight, you know, he definitely was matched up with a guy who was also a ground game person. And so you weren't really sure, you know, a lot of time you get like a wrestler or there's a grappler or whatever that you're going to get a striking fight. Um, But uh, Gad Zimurov, uh, uh, 
took him down. <laughs> like, and everybody's like, huh, that's weird. Cause he wins all his fights by submission. Like he literally has a hundred percent finishing rate and all that. So the one thing you would think that you probably shouldn't do is take him down, but he did. Uh, so he got a triangle like in less than three minutes and he really wants that Shogun rematch. Didn't see that fight, but that's crazy yeah. to, to hear. I didn't even know that, that his opponent took him down yeah. and he got triangled after that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so he kind of, it was kind of, it kind of took a minute of like repositioning and this and that. Um, yeah. But he ended up getting a triangle and so setting mm -hmm. another record. Um, so good for him. But so, like I said, uh, he's hoping to get a Shogun rematch because they fought in uh, November. And neither of them really had a full camp for that because Shogun was training for somebody else. Um, I forget who, and that fight fell apart. And so Paul only had a couple of weeks for that one. And so even though they fought to a draw, you know, both of those guys are like, yeah, okay, I recognize that um, the next fight could be different slash better, you know what I mean, on either part. Um, and so maybe that's something that will come along. Like I said, Shogun said he only has a couple few fights left. So oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he did say, we asked him about it and he said he would consider that. Um, mm -hmm. but at this point you never really know cause Shogun is looking for those legacy fights. If he's only got a couple few left and you yeah. know, actually he's managed by the same guy, uh, Damian Maya's manager, Eduardo also manages Shogun. And so we were talking Eduardo's like, yeah, I'm in the same boat for Eduardo. I mean, for uh, Damian too. Like I have these Brazilian legends. I have these guys that I really need to not protect because protect isn't the right word, but orchestrate the end in a really specific way. Um, so I don't know what's next for Shogun or, or Damien for that matter, but um, um, all right. So then uh, Cowboy Oliveira, um, who I just love, he had a decision win over Peter Sabata, who that was Peter Sabata's last fight on uh, his UFC contract too. Mm. Unfortunately, I think he has quite an arm injury, so I don't know what the future holds for him. You know, he hadn't been that active and had like two babies in two years. He opened a gym, he had a neck injury and all this stuff. So he had a lot of uh, stuff going on in his life, but he came back and he was really excited to kind of fight, try to kick ass and get a new contract. So I don't know what will happen for him, but for Cowboy Oliveira, that's two wins in a row now. Like he had lost a few in a row uh, cause he was saying he had like a lot of family problems. And remember now he just gave birth to his, his one, well, I can't say his way. The birth of his 10th ch child just happened. <laughs> no way. 10th. It's 10th? Cowboy. 10, you, 10 kids. He's, what? he's a cowboy. He's a cowboy. All right. Oh, my goodness. 10 child. You better get those bonuses, baby. Get those That's bonuses. the thing. He's gotten like he's five or excited. six bonuses. Uh, so Cowboy got, got back on the winning track. But, Alan, we got to talk about Hamzat Mother Kraken Shemayev. Shemayev. He's a threat. We saw what he could do. I mean, there's no breaking down the fight. He takes people down immediately, and usually after a strike. He's very, very good at hitting you, landing. It's not like a feint. He makes contact. He covers distance very well. When he shoots, he just comes at you like he's, like he's hovering across the ground. It's not a typical... Uh, there you go. You guys Sorry, I lost you guys for a second. Yeah. It's not a typical level change type thing. He throws everything that he has into a shot, covers about five feet of distance, and then takes you out very low, like below the knees, he's able to go and, and level change it down. He's a big problem for, for, for anyone, but it just to fight in that amount of time and, and, and for those kind of numbers, two weight divisions within like 10 days or so, and then not even get hit, it's incredible. He's a big problem. Um, as I mentioned before the show, there's a couple of people that I feel like really stood out, especially international fighters during this entire uh, fight island yeah. event. He was the number one guy on my list. He's the guy that I feel like out of all the people that we have, we have gotten to know their names or we've gotten to say, you know, this person's going to be a star. He's a guy that is on the tip of Dana's tongue right now. Dana is at, Dana is granting him whatever he likes. Dana's going to put him on the next card in August. Dana, Dana, Dana's in love with people that can fight like this, yeah. but I think he sees something. I think everybody sees something. He doesn't move like normal people. He's able to just move so freely on the mat, and, and he's very strong in, in his pressure. Um, he does, the, the, you know, the Dagestani, what do you call it, the Dagestani handcuff? Handcuff, or right. He's very good at going from that to the choke, that to the choke, very much like the guy who looks exactly like him, Khabib. Um, it, it's kind of weird how much they, they look alike and fight somewhat alike. I mean, if we really break down this style, there's, there's some similarities, but there's some yeah. big differences. Um, but yes, they have a very... Similar look, similar fighting style, but no one that I could ever ever remember in my lifetime, Karen, 
has made such an impact in such a short amount of time as he has. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they throw him somebody in the top 15 next and after that, somebody in the top five. Yeah, he's, he, he's incredible. Um, some people call him Kabig um, <laughs> and stuff like that. Because uh, like you said, he fights. His first fight was at 185, and he took no punches. Then 10 days later, he fought at 170 and took two punches <laughs> and absolutely wailed on those guys. But just so, so people know, um, he is actually Chechen. You know, he, he's born in Chechnya. But he trains in Sweden, um, and he speaks four languages, Russian, Chechen, Swedish, and English. Um, but he trains with the guys at uh, All Star. So basically, he trains with Gus. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was, talking to, uh, I was talking to Alex about him, but also just some other people on the team and in the management. So Hamzat trains with Alir Latifi, Jimmy Manawa, uh, Alexander Gustafsson, and um, I'm told he can ragdoll all of them, any and all of them. Uh, that he takes down Alir Latifi, who, if you remember, Alir Latifi's built like a freaking tank. Wow. Um, a two of fiver. And, you know, so he, he's in there training with two of fivers and heavyweights. And uh, Gus was saying basically like Hamzat was one, is one of his primary training partners this whole time anyway. And literally, like, they're, they're like, how can we say this? They're like, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like, it's, it's, they're like, this guy is the greatest thing you've ever seen. Like, they're, Wow. Because you can't even downplay it, right? Because then you see it in person, you're like, holy crap, like, you're totally right. And they're like, no, 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 like, no, 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 no. Like, you don't even know what he can do. And they're like, look at the striking. You haven't even seen it yet, right? Because all he's done is like power. I know, I want to see down. him strike so right. badly. They're like, look at his striking is Gus's striking, right? So they're like, so imagine every single thing that Alexander Gustafson was taught. That's exactly the same thing that Hamzat was taught. They're like, he has the same striking as Gus. You just haven't seen it. And I'm like, He's a big problem. He's a big problem. He, um, look, he's in my division. He's a big problem. You saw Gilbert Burns said the same thing. He's, he's, he's different. This guy, yeah. this guy is going to smash a lot of people, man. Smash. He's, um, and, well, and and it, he's like an eight and oh, yeah. uh, or something like that. He, he's got, he's gone on to the first round like twice in his entire career. He's probably only been punched in the face about 10 times. In his, so his chin is solid. It's um the sky's the limit for the guy, and to know that right away he's getting that Conor McGregor ish love from Dana White, right? Big big things. Dana White has to be so happy. I mean, to think other sports aren't even happening. I was able to put on these shows right. in Fight Island, and not only did I put on these shows, but superstar possible superstars have arose, have risen from this. He's got to yeah. be so happy with this, and, and to have somebody like. I, 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 I'm trying, I, can't, I wrote his name down. Kamat, say it again. Hamzat. Hamzat. So it's spelled K H A M Z A T. So Hamzat. Shemaev. Shemaev, yeah. Hamzat Shemaev. Hamzat I Shemaev. Get that name down. He's awesome. So I literally, like, I even said on Saturday before he even fought, I was, I tweeted out, I'm like, I'm just fully admitting that I'm on this hype train. Like, I am all aboard. Choo choo. I'm putting, like, the little train emoji. Like, the dude is awesome so yeah. really really uh really think he's the the, the story of the uh of the, of the of fight island for me um yeah. in terms of like like you said the big takeaway star uh and yeah so overall um it was amazing i don't know um you know uh, i was gonna say on that note you said all of fight island you would say shamaya was probably your biggest takeaway out of all the events he well he was my he was the uh, unexplained unexpected story that I got yeah. out of uh out of Fight yeah. Island to me like to me that's the dude I emerged with with the most like can't wait to see what you do next for me also it was um the return of Whitaker which I you know oh, I was yeah. just totally thrilled about um and obviously we saw like a new champion crowned in Figueredo last week and stuff like that but um Big story, yeah. to me actually the, the whole the 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 takeaway for me was like the unity in the UFC. If I, I know yeah. that sounds like really weird and stuff, but I was talking to Dana about it and stuff. And he's like, look, I just am looking out for my ecosystem and our people are, we know we're good people. The world is what it is, but if I can take care of my people and my team, then I'm going to do it. And they did it. And we might get to go back to fight Island at some point. I got Vegas shows coming up. Um, but it, the whole thing was, uh, was actually absolutely incredible. And to think that all these other sports are trying to get started and they're having some hiccups. They're having some hiccups right now. UFC was able to get it done. 
And we're, again, we're talking about international fighters. I mean, it's so, it's so different, but uh, they were able to make it work. But um, like I said, I, I wanted to give you the list I wrote down. Shamaya, same thing for me. All of Fight Island, yeah. well, I, this is my list of like kind of prospects, international people that we didn't really know who they were until Fight Island. This yeah. guy is now going to be a global superstar, superstar, I think. Number two on my list, Amanda, Amanda Rivas. Amanda yes. Rivas came in here, didn't really know her. We fell in love with her personality. She has a beautiful performance, and she beats a name like Paige Van Zandt that then you take her hype train and you, and you jump on board with it. So she was my number two yep. that Dana White has, has, has to say, look, I have another female star again. It's so import, important to have these female stars like the Ronda Rouseys and everyone else. Uh, and the number three was the uh, eerie. Judy. I, please help me. Perkoya, per per yes. The big 205er from, from Prohaska, um, yes. Prohaska. Yeah, Eric Vasquez, the 205 er that came in. Uh, who was it that he beat? I, I can't, I can't quite remember who it was, but he had that incredible knockout over the Russian. Uh, right, it was he, three weeks ago, Alan. I don't remember. I'm blanking on it, but Eric, he, he's the 205 er He has that Johnny Walker kind of style. Yes. Um, phenomenal. Fell in love with that guy when I saw his movement during the warm up. He is a guy that I could see fighting John Jones in the very near future. And he's got that likable style and everything about him. Those three, those three people right there, big stars that Dana was able to find yeah. during this time, international stars that we weren't able to see the last couple of months. Right. Now we're seeing him at Fight Island. So great takeaways from the entire, all of the events. Yeah, those are three solid choices. And actually, Amanda Hibas had called out the winner of the Carla Esparza Rodriguez fight. So maybe we will see Ooh, Hibas man. versus Esparza, which would be, uh, which would be really cool. But um, yeah. All right, well, I, uh, I um, got to just let people know if you want to follow me on Instagram, KB Heat. Like I said, if you check my stories, the highlights, I have like a ton of stuff from Fight Island. So, uh, and there's also my, my trip around the racetrack is uh, on my Instagram TV and also on YouTube and Facebook and stuff. So uh, you can follow me at KB Heat on Instagram, Karen Bryant everywhere else. You can follow our producer, Wade Eck, across the board. Alan, where can folks find you? Yeah, and I'm at Alan Joban across all social media. Follow all of us. Get tuned in, guys. We always appreciate you guys watching and checking it out. And I appreciate the support that we get. I'm going to heal up. I'm going to stay home, quarantine, and uh, hopefully get a fight uh, next couple of months. That's right. I hope you feel fine. And, of course, take care of uh, yourself and your family. You've got to make sure that you're feeling good, Alan. We need you healthy. Uh, don't forget, just across the board, also, you can just follow straight up MMA Heat. Um, but thanks for tuning in, folks, and take care of yourselves. Take care, guys.